Hello everybody, my name is Yuval and I'm a research team lead at Armis. I'm Gal and I'm a researcher at Armis. Today we're going to talk to you about our research dub Teal Storm, so let's get going. Um, okay, so a quick word about Armis. Uh, Armis is a company that uh, does passive network monitoring, acid inventory and anomaly detection. Uh, we are part of the research team which is focused on vulnerability research of embedded, embedded systems. We discover critical vulnerabilities that impact billions of devices and design and innovate security solutions in order to mitigate the risk coming from IoT devices. Okay. Not very innovative. <laughs> Okay. Some technical issue. Okay. <coughs> okay, so <laughs> this is what we're gonna cover today. Uh, what Tearstorm actually is, what is CPS and how it can be used in the, as an attack vector, how we found and exploited some of the vulnerabilities, and some of the implications that arise from our research. And of course, a live demo, you should expect some smoke. So, um, TLS is a set of three critical vulnerabilities on APC's smart UPS product line, as you can see here. They enable remote call execution from the internet, and using them can cause physical damage to the device or its surroundings. Uh, these devices are very common, with over 20 million units sold, and according to our data, they can be found in 8 out of 10 enterprises around the world. Uh, so what is CPS? CPS stands for Cyber Physical Systems. Essentially, it means connected computers with physical abilities, and these computers can be found all around us like door controllers, autonomous vehicles, uh, smart air conditioning, and advanced medical devices. And the fact that these devices have physical abilities makes them a target. Like this case of a hack at a German steel mill that caused, quote, massive damage. In this case, there were no casualties, but you don't need to imagine too hard a different scenario. Like this case of the hack of the Ukraini Ukrainian power grid back in 2015. It is the first confirmed hack to take down a power grid, leaving more than 230,000 residents in the dark. And if you ask yourself, what about the backup uh, systems of uh, the control centers? First, they, the attackers reconfigured the UPS responsible for providing backup power to the control centers. So we now know that UPSs are a target for hackers in the real world, but this was only reconfiguring it. The attacking it directly can cause much more damage. Um, what is a UPS? UPS stands for Uninterruptible Power Supply, ensuring connected devices don't suffer any downtime. But a spoiler alert, our research will put this on. So, in the normal operation, the UPS just transfers power from the grid to the connected device. But in the case of an outage, it automatically switches to the battery, not letting the connected devices suffer any downtime. And these devices cannot suffer any downtime uh, because by definition they are mission critical, like medical devices, OT equipment, or IT equipment. Our research focused on a, um, on a device set by APC, which is a part of Schneider Electric since 07, and it was chosen because it is the market leader in what is called smart UPSs. In this case, smart UPS is a, a branded name by APC. Historically, UPSs were fully analog devices, but they become smarter, letting software control more of the operation of the, of the device. Uh, some of these devices have a feature called Smart Connect, which is basically a dedicated Ethernet port connecting the device to the cloud. So we have a CPS device that we know is a target for hackers and is connected directly to the internet. So we ask ourselves, is there a potential risk here? And in order to answer this question, uh, we laid out the milestones uh, for this research. First, find a viable internet attack vector and, and find out if there is one. Second, find a remote code execution vulnerability. 
And last, find a way to tamper with the output power of the device, showing how this CPS device is dangerous in its own way. So let's overview this Smart Connect feature. The first thing to notice is that this cloud is a cloud in the classic sense, meaning it is not inside the network, it is in, really in the internet. And the second, th second thing is, is that um, this device is the one uh, creating the communication with the server. So it can bypass firewalls or NAT gateways or other defensive infrastructure you have. This is how the UI looks like. It indicates the battery power or the firmware version. And another almost hidden feature is that the cloud can perform remote firmware updates to the device. And this is in the network perspective. There are two things to note here. First, the device performs the uh, communication via TLS, and this is how it's encrypted and authenticated. And second, the device, uh, before the communication, performs a DNS query of the cloud's domain. So an attacker could potentially uh, attack uh, with this uh, attack vector if they can, could perform a DNS spoofing of the, uh, and get a, get a man in the middle. But this is not theoretical. This is something that ha have happened in the past. Take this tweet referring to what was thought to be a 2017 hack of Wikileaks. It was later found to be DNS spoofing of the domain of Wikileaks, showing that this is something that equipped attackers can facilitate even in modern times. So we can um, safely say that we have found our internet attack vector. Now to the second step, finding the remote code execution vulnerability. These are the steps we're going to need to take in order to find this vulnerability. First, find the firmware um, in order to reverse it and get to the second step, actually finding the vulnerability and they should be as severe as possible before authentication takes place without any user interaction needed and, as we said, from the internet. For those of you who come from the um, endpoint security world, we essentially aim at a zero-click vulnerability. So, let's dive in as to the firmware. Um, the firmware file can be, can be achieved from the um, update wizard supplied by APC, and as you can see in the histogram on the right, uh, it, it seems to be encrypted, with most bytes uh, distributed equally. Some bytes are more common than others, as you can see in the little spikes, but long story short, uh, we didn't find a way to brute force the decryption of, of, the, of the firmware file. So we went on a different approach. The board itself. There we found two socks, or CPUs. One of them is closer to the PHY, which is the chip that is responsible for parsing and sending of Ethernet frames. We figured, because these two are close, that sock number two is the one that is responsible for the network operation of the device, which is where we hope to find the vulnerability. And we also found this debug interface connected to the um, JTAG pins of the device, so we could connect to it and potentially debug the CPU directly. So we connected it and gave it a go. Okay, maybe you heard that, uh, but this annoying sounds is what the UPS makes when you connect the JTAG uh, the JTAG interface, and this means that the UPS is frozen. It doesn't work normally anymore, and the only way to revert it is with a hard manual reboot. And after some head scratching, we went to the wisest of them all, which is uh, the manual, or in this case, the SOX datasheet. There we found out about a feature called RDP. Um, what is RDP? This is how it's described. Uh, I focused the important parts for you, and the only important parts. Uh, Essentially, what it means is that when the JTAG interface is connected, the flash, uh, the access to the flash is shut out. And the, the only way to revert it is with a reboot. So, to summarize, um, when we connect the JTAG, we don't have access to the flash anymore, but we still have access to the RAM. Uh, the, the only way to, to revert it is with a reboot, but we get a snapshot of the RAM in the same moment we connected the debugger. So, we can just dump the firmware, but we didn't give up, we just needed a little help from a little friend. And in this case, it is a smaller UPS by APC. And we label these two with and without, because only one of them has the Smart Connect uh, feature we talked about. But they are both smart, so they're, they're both, both part of the Smart Connect uh, device family. Uh, only one of them, uh, both of them has RDP, but on one of them it is turned off. So. Uh, this is surprising because we already know that APC knows about this feature and how to use it, but nonetheless it was turned off. We just connected the debug interface, dumped the firmware, and could reverse it without any problems. 
We focus on the decryption process in order to decrypt the original firmware's uh, decryption, and unfortunately, they are both uh, they have a different uh, encryption. This was not the end of it because we found the last clue. They have a similar firmware package structure, and to see why this is such a big hint, take this into consideration. We figured a similar firmware structure means a similar update process. So we took on the similar, the, the small firmware, the small UPS's uh, update process and found out that it decrypts the firmware chunk by chunk, each time placing one chunk in memory uh, temporarily. And remember, we can peek into the RAM using the debug interface. So we have a game plan to extract the entire firmware. We initiate a firmware update. We wait for the correct chunk to be stored in the, in the memory. We dump the memory to get the chunk and reboot deck to exit the RDP restricted state. If we repeat this time and time again, we could get the entire firmware, but not so fast. Each iteration like this takes a lot of human interaction, like timing for the correct chunk to be stored in memory, a pressing of physical buttons in order to initiate the update, and the pulling of the battery to perform the hard manual reboot. Each iteration like that takes about five minutes, and even if we do get a different chunk every iteration, there are about 1,200 chunks in total. So to sum all of this, it's going to take us weeks of grinding to get out the encrypted firmware. So we took on this approach. We used a Raspberry Pi to control all of the elements. The, um, the power pins of the sock instead of pulling out the battery. The electrical signal of the buttons instead of pressing them. Of course, the uh, debug interface to dump the RAM and timing with better precision that we could ever get manually. We also targeted only the bootloader part, which is where the decryption takes place. If we get the decryption and decrypt the decryption key, we can dec uh, decrypt the entire firmware without brute forcing all of it. On the right, you can check out the Frankenstein setup we had in our lab. Uh, if you want to read more about it, there is a white paper you can check out. So, after um, a night of running this setup, we got our decrypted firmware, so we could start reversing. Uh, the first thing we noticed is that while the firmware file is encrypted, it is not signed. And also the decryption uses a symmetric key, which is the same for every device line. And this is why this is the first vulnerability we found, because if an attacker gets uh, their hands on uh, this key like we did, they could create a malicious uh, firmware and install it to get code execution, either with physical access through USB or with... Um, LAN access and get remote code execution. But this is not the end of it because we looked for a vulnerability from the internet. Now Gal will explain how we found this vulnerability, how we exploited it, and how we leveraged it in a fiery way. <coughs> okay, so as you both said, um, we were looking to expand the internet attack surface, the, the remote, code, remote code execution surface from the LAN to the internet. And we already know that devices supporting the, the Smart Connect feature expose themselves to an internet attack surface. And we know from a black box traffic inspection that the Smart Connect uses TLS as its authentication mechanism. Um, so to challenge the integrity of this authentication process, um, we dipped in uh, and took a look uh, in the, the firmware that we just decrypted. Uh, decrypted, and we found that for the TLS implementation, the APC uses uh, an external library called Nano SSL, developed by Mokana, a company that supplies third-party cryptographic solutions. And though uh, the use of external libraries... This is not the demo. Yeah, this is not the demo yet, but it's a hint. Uh, the use of ex external libraries, it has a lot of advantages on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also brings in a built-in uncertainty, especially when closed source libraries are used. And if they have bugs, they bring their bugs with them to your code. But even if the, uh, if the external library is implemented perfectly with no bugs at all, it doesn't mean that a careless usage of the, of the external code cannot put your code uh, in risk. If the glue logic that connects the external code to the internal code uh, relies on wrong assumptions. If the API is not used as documented in the manuals, it can put your code at risk. And we have a perfect example here. We can see that uh, Mokana, that uh, APC uses the Mokana functionality, but it completely return, uh, ignores the return value. Um, it, it's, uh, it trusts Mokana to handle 
the errors internally and do whatever needed. But on the other end, we know that Mukana instructs, instructs the user to uh, to uh, handle the error that it propagates up and, for example, shuts the connection down uh, if necessary. And this seemingly minor confusion, minor issue, uh, we were able to elevate it to uh, two critical vulnerabilities, zero click that enables us to do basically everything from the internet. And the first one is a, is a heap overflow vulnerability that we will not detail in this talk. Uh, it is also detailed in the white paper that Yuval mentioned before. The vulnerability that we will detail about is the uh, TLS authentication bypass vulnerability that basically allows us to uh, masquerade as the APC's cloud. And from there, we can use the Smart Connect uh, features. And, and this is basically the last missing piece of the puzzle to uh, have uh, an internet attack scenario. But to understand this vulnerability, well, we first need to be familiar with kind of a niche TLS feature called TLS resumption. Uh, and this feature allows parties to, uh, to reestablish uh, uh, their connection uh, using their already proven trust between them after uh, the first authentication, if authentication. And what they do in their first authentication, they first exchange session ID. Uh, and then uh, they, do the, they do the authentication and exchange keys. And after that, the generated key, the master secret that it is used for the encryption and decryption of communication is stored along with the session ID. So when they want to reestablish the connection, they can simply just present the session ID once again and hop straight to, to the communication phase without going through the uh, handshake phase once again and simply use the master secret from before. But this uh, feature comes with a hidden risk because if one party somehow manages to uh, convince the other one that uh, they should uh, resume the se uh, session that did not even start uh, the first time, it means that uh, the, the full side will use, will fetch master secret that was not generated and it's an undefined secret and this undefined secret might be predictable depending on the, uh, the code base of the TLS implementation. And if it's predictable, it means that authentication can be bypassed. And in our case, um, we already know that the Mokana API handling bug ensures that the session uh, keep, remains hanging regardless of the error code. And we can see that the session ID is stored during the uh, handshake process, but the master secret is generated only after a successful handshake. This means that if we uh, fail right after storing the, uh, the, uh, the session ID in place, um, we can uh, try to uh, launch a pre-authentication uh, pre resumption attack with the, uh, with the same session ID, as can be seen here. We can start with sending a bad handshake with the session ID of our choice. Then we start a resumption, uh, resumption process using the same session ID. And we know from taking a look at the code that the master secret at that time is just the initialization zeros. So we can predict the master secrets will be no so secret anymore zeros. And we can use zeros for encrypting and decrypting the communication. And by doing that, we just bypassed the, the authentication. And we'll see uh, how we do that step by step. So we need to send two packets. The first one is using a magic ID, a session ID that we choose, and an invalid cipher suite, FDFD. It starts with setting the uh, um, the resumption boolean to false. Then uh, it compares the received session ID to the stored one, but for the first bucket it always fails because the stored one uh, it, it, the session ID was not stored in the object yet. Um, and then it checks if it's a resumption, and because it is not a resumption, it sets the session ID in the uh, in the object and. Then it checks and validates the cipher suite, but because it's invalid, the cipher suite member uh, remains blank, and the check of the cipher suite fails, and it returns no cipher suite error code. But <coughs> this error code is returned, uh, is ignored, excuse me, and we can send another entry packet, this time um, with the same session ID, but a valid cipher suite, and the resumption boolean is set to false again, then the uh, session ID is, is compared, but this time it provides a match because we set the same one in place. So the resumption boolean is set to true. Uh, the check of the resumption boolean uh, um, indicates that the, the session ID is not supposed to be copied once again. 
And the next thing is checking the cipher suite, which is valid this time and it sets the field. And when we check the cipher suite, uh, we, pass, we pass the validation check. And because it's a resumption uh, flow, we try to uh, fetch the key from the memory, but because it was not initialized, it was not generated, it's only zeros. And we can see how it looks in Wireshark. So uh, the client starts, the UPS starts with sending client hello message, and the malform, the, uh, the malicious attacker uh, sends to uh, server hello packets of itself. But, um, the first one highlighted in red is, is the session ID we chose and an invalid cipher suite. And the second one in blue uses the same session ID, but a valid cipher suite. And from there, we can see that they keep communicated, communicating as uh, like trusted parties with applicative messages. And by doing that, um, we can now connect three uh, different dots. Uh, we know that we can bypass the uh, authentication of the Smart Connect. We know that the Smart Connect feature uh, allows us to, uh, to uh, perform a remote firmware upgrade. And we also know that we have a vulnerability of the missing signage of the firmware. And combining these three allow an attacker to uh, basically install from the internet uh, a self-crafted malicious firmware. But um, we, we, we have the remote code execution, of course. Uh, and we wonder what can an attacker do by installing a malicious firmware? What would he want the firmware to do? So we have, of course, the common risk of using the, uh, the UPS as a bridge to the internal network and using the installation of the firmware as a persistent stronghold inside the network. And from there, an attacker can spread to other connected devices. And uh, basically, from there, the, the, the way to launch a ransomware attack is pretty short. But we want to highlight the, the, the abilities of the UPS with its own uniqueness and the unique characteristics. And we also know that the UPS supplies, uh, uh, supplies power to uh, mission-critical devices. And we can cause enormous infrastructure damage by simply shutting them down because they cannot tolerate downtime. So this is uh, an attack that we can do. And, of, and as for the UPS itself, an attacker can also uh, break the UPS by simply, for example, erasing the flash that stores the firmware by running the code there and basically disable the UPS totally. But we, we wanted to, 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 to look for uh, maybe some more sophisticated attack attacks to please our pyromania. And to measure the maximum potential impact, we should have a better understanding of the system. So we start with the most basic principle of, of the UPS operation, which is converting the DC voltage of the battery to uh, an, an AC power signal that imitates the, um, the power grid power signal. And the more it's, it's similar to the, uh, the power grid signal, the better. And to perfect this, this uh, output signal, the UPS software is involved, but we wanted to measure how much. And uh, to understand that, I'll take you to a short journey to the innards of a modern smart UPS. But for simplicity, I'll first split the UPS blocks to two halves. So we have the left half, uh, which is responsible for all the communication interfaces from the display panel, the USB, and the, and the Ethernet ports. And this is the CPU that we researched by this point, and there we found our vulnerabilities that we just presented. But when causing damage and causing power damage is what we're looking for, the right half is much more interesting. The Texas Instruments CPU supervises the, um, the, all the electri uh, electrical operation. And for example, it switches between uh, relaying the power input when available or the battery input when the, uh, the power grid is down. And it is also responsible for forming the output waveform of the signal that uh, is converted from the battery to the power outlets. And by understanding how it is, do it is doing that, how it's forming uh, this, uh, this output signal, we were able to find our first smart attack, which is drawing uh, an output signal of our choice. And in this case, um, we, uh, draw, um, we attempted and achieved a, an overvoltage signal using a, a square wave signal that reached to up to more than 330 volts compared compare to the 330 volts that the European power grid uh, uses. And we could manipulate the frequency of the signal as well. As you can see here at 200 
hertz instead of 50 hertz. And this poses connected devices to a way more destructive impact because um, we can actually damage them with a, with a tampered signal rather than just shutting them down. And this is the uh, first smart uh, attack that we found. But to understand how we can abuse the UPS itself, we need an even more intimate understanding of the system. Okay, so these are the main blocks of the power conversion operation. And the highlighted MCU is the, uh, the Texas Instruments that we have shown earlier. But to have a better understanding of the operation, I will introduce you with some new players. And we'll start with the age bridge. And this is a key component of the power conversion process because it allows the changes uh, in the polarity of the, of the voltage. Uh, it's connected to a, but to a battery on top and ground on bottom. And by transferring between three stage, uh, three uh, different states, we can have positive voltage uh, on the load, negative voltage on the load, or zero voltage that we'll ignore to simplify the model. But we'll be back to the age bridge shortly. And this is the battery that uh, is connected that supplies the voltage to the age bridge. This is the UPS battery. And it is connected in parallel to a capacitor called DC Link capacitor. Uh, it's like a superhero. It's a team player. Its purpose there is to handle the uh, the current that develops because of the uh, the pulses, the changes in the voltage in the age bridge, and it absorbs these currents and protects the, the the other components of the circuit by doing so. And the next component is the transformer, which is that this is just a pair of coupled inductors that. It is used as the load of uh, the edge bridge, and its purpose is to uh, convert the digital pulses to uh, an analog AC waveform, like the output expects. And this is the actual output, the load, the power outlets uh, of the UPS. And last but not least is the MOSFET drivers block, which is just a bunch of integrated circuits that are used as mediators between the MCU and the edge bridge. Um, that's all we need to know about it. But let's start with understanding uh, how the edge bridge is used to convert DC signal to AC. So, um, as we mentioned, by closing only Q1 and Q4, uh, we can have positive voltage on the transformer on the load and negative voltage when closing the other, the other diagonal pair. And we go back to positive voltage and back and forth. So we, we get a steady pulse like signal that alternates the direction periodically like an AC signal. But in the analog world, these pulse-like signals are not isolated from other parts of the circuit, and connected components react to meaningful voltage changes of, of each other. And such relation exists between the uh, transformer voltage and uh, the battery voltage that supplies the edge bridge. And we can see here in green the uh, transformer voltage, and we can see that the moment it changes uh, um, sharply, it triggers some voltage fluctuations on the battery. And there are minor voltage fluctuations, but they, uh, they develop, they causing the development of some current. And this is exactly where our superhero, the DC link capacitor comes handy because it absorbs these currents and it wastes them in a form of a negligible, negligible uh, heat. But it, it's really negligible because it cools off fast enough between the periods and the whole operation can keep, uh, happening um, in steady state. <coughs> but we do understand that it is a very risky uh, point to look on, to look on um, because we can control the age bridge. We can orchestrate the age bridge because we, have, we, we took over the, the Texas Instrument MCU using the vulnerability. So we ask ourselves, what, what sort of state would we want the age bridge to be founded to uh, cause damage? And thinking of that, the answer is not very sophisticated. It's quite simple. If we close the switches of the same side simultaneously, we sorry, and, and we uh, um, we connect the, the 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 battery directly to the ground, and by doing that, we can basically blow the UPS up. So let's do that, but not too fast. You remember the MOSFET drivers, the mediator between the MCU and the H bridge. So one of its purposes is preventing exactly this. It has an, an outdoor implementation of protection that prevents the, um, both the switches of same side to be uh, closed simultaneously, and we can do nothing to overcome it using software. But 
What about some other weird states? What about open circuit? And this one is not protected by the MOSFET driver. So let's find out what happens when you do that. So this time I'll talk about the current on the transformer and I'll switch between two states, valid states where the current develops and the open circuit state when the current immediately cuts off. And we switch between these two states, but to be able to compare it to the normal flow, we want to be to, to translate this graph back to voltage terms. And let's see how it's possible. So um, I'll not dig into the physics of it, but in inductors, there is a relation between uh, voltage and current. Uh, the, the voltage level represents the current change. Uh, it equals the current slope. And the voltage is positive when, it's in, when the current increases and negative when the current decreases. And in the open, in the open circuit states, um, by the time when we cut off the, uh, the current immediately, we have a very sharp decrease in current. And a very sharp decrease in current means a very low voltage level. And when the current stabilizes, of course, the voltage equals zero, and then uh, it goes up a little bit. But every time, in every period when the current, when the current cut off, cuts off, we have a very low voltage level. And how low? You can see right here. So this is a capture of the oscilloscope in our lab uh, during these periods of uh, current cutoff. We can see in yellow the transformer voltage and in red the battery voltage. And this is the exact moment of the current cutoff. And we can see that the voltage decreases dramatically from the battery voltage level of around 26 volts to an amazing, amazingly low level of minus 54 volts. And this change triggered the fluctuation that I mentioned before of the battery voltage. And it fluctuates for an amazing and huge margin between 40 volts and 7 volts. And it happens fast, very fast, at around 1 microsecond. And putting these numbers together, um, we can calculate that the, the current that flows through the DC link capacitor will get to an astonishingly high level of almost 100 kiloampere current. That's a lot. That's really a lot. And let's see what happens to the DC link capacitor when this happens. So the DC link capacitor starts at around the room temperature, let's say 25 degrees Celsius. This is the bar on the right. And the moment we cut off the, uh, the current and the battery voltage starts fluctuating and develop current, the capacitor starts heating up. But it's not heating up too much, and it even starts to cool off between the periods. But when we uh, have the second period of the cutoff, the, the, the temperature of the capacitors it keeps heating up from a higher level than it was at the first cycle. And basically, there is nothing to stop it from keep heating up, and uh, it, it keeps heating up, and we left the, some software safety measures out of the, out of the malicious firmer, and... We have Superman that, that tries to uh, help us, but even he cannot handle 150 degrees Celsius. And the capacitor simply, simply <coughs> bursts and fills the room with evaporated electrolyte material and keeps the, uh, and the UPS remaining without any, uh, any component that's supposed to uh, save it from, uh, from uh, these current spikes. So, as we promised, I'll show you how a specific CPS device can be destructive in its own unique way. And I can actually, by understanding the specific system, can toast the UPS. And now, for the fun part, let's burn UPS right here live on stage. Uh, I, I will run the exploitation and Yuval will explain what I'm doing. Okay, so um, while Gal uh, <laughs> prepares it, I will explain to you what's going to happen. Um, beforehand, this UPS is pre-hacked, meaning we already installed malicious firmware on it to save time during this, uh, during this demo. Um, Gal will showcase both of the types of attacks he talked about. He will show power tampering, he will show um, attacking the, the UPS itself. So first, he will... Um, he will perform an undervoltage attack, um, sending a lower waveform to the lamp, connected lamp, and we will see, we'll see it shine really weak, 
Um, on normal devices, this could cause undefined behavior. If it's connected to a server, it could operate one minute and stop operating the next. Um, okay. Right now, it's going to be... Yeah. Right now, we're only going to see light. Okay. Great. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. Under voltage, we said. It's really under voltage, yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> now we will change the waveform to perform over voltage. We will send out a square waveform and it will get to about 330 volt. Um, the light should shine bright and it's going to be noisy. Okay, so. <laughs> um, the UPS is not designed to, to work with uh, this amount of power. So uh, the inner components vibrate, and this is what you hear. And the, the bulb could potentially explode if, it, if it's going to do it long enough, uh, which you want. Uh, if you missed it, uh, we're going to show it again. OK. <laughs> uh, now to the, to the second type of attack, which is the main and final event. Because after this, uh, the UPS uh, will not operate anymore. Um, yes, so um, now what uh, Gal does is <laughs> attacking the H-bridge, which, which is connected to the transformer, um, which is going to overheat the capacitor until it, it bursts. And there's going to be some smoke here. Uh, this is why the window is open. Uh, I don't know if, you, if I hope it works, or I <laughs> hope it doesn't, because it's going to get uh, somewhat smoky. Uh, this we couldn't test before, uh, right now, because then the UPS would have been dead. Uh, but we have uh, a mountain of these destroyed UPSs back at our lab. Uh, um, check out. Microphone. Sound. Horrible sound. Can you hear something? Yeah, maybe it's too high for a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a broken or a bad thing. <laughs> the capacitor is super yeah. suffering right now. Pray for him. <laughs> These are the special effects for the show. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm really sorry for the smell, but yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't get bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Gal, Gal stopped it uh, pretty quick. Uh, on the on the blog we posted, there's a video of this uh, performed in a safe environment. You can see just how much smoke it can get out. Um, it, this could potentially, while it destroys the UPS, this could potentially hurt the surroundings. Uh, there's known to be sparks when this happens. Um, known to be sparks uh, when this happens. And if, if it goes on long enough, it could... Um, create some spark that will go outside the UPS and damage the surroundings. So not only the UPS is um, in, in danger, not only the connected device is in da danger, but also the surrounding devices are in danger. Um, okay, we're going to let it uh, steam for a bit. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> sorry. So, um, after that, I think we can safely say that 
we got the last milestone of this research, uh, p- tempering with the power of the UPS, just like you've seen right now on stage. And to recap how easy it is to launch such an attack, uh, let's look at it at a network perspective. First, see the normal operation of the cloud, of the cloud uh, communication. First, the UPS queries the IP of the, first, the UPS queries the IP of the, of the cloud, which the DNS will surely reply. The UPS will then supply proof and begin authentication, which the cloud is going to verify with its own proof, which the UPS is going to verify, and then they can safely exchange their messages. Now for the attack scenario. First, the attacker is going to poison the cache of the DNS. The UPS uh, will begin with the same query, but this time the DNS will respond with the attacker's IP. The UPS will initiate communication, and the attacker will reply with a beautiful logo, which the UPS is going to mistakenly confirm. From there, the attacker can upload a malicious firmware and launch attack all throughout the network, attack connected devices, and the UPS itself, (laughs) just like we've seen now in the demo. And if you want to know how you can be protected from such a, from such attack, the first thing you can, it, there are three main things you can do simultaneously. And the first one of them is apply patches where applicable. We worked with Schneider to develop a patch for these vulnerabilities. So if you use one of these devices, you should go ahead and patch. The second th- thing is minimize the, the attack surface. In this case, it means that um, if you have the smart connect feature connected and you don't use it, you should disconnect it. And the last thing is to monitor communication. Uh, we've seen this um, um, in our uh, clients that sometimes um, network administrators don't know what devices they exactly have and whether or not they're connected to the internet. This way can could let you know which devices you have, what versions are they, are they if they're patched, and if there is an attack coming, you could be notified. Uh, this is the last security ring you can put in your organization. Uh, so, the takeaways. Uh, the first thing is external libraries could be a weak spot. Uh, we th- we've seen this in the log4j case, and in this case, where external libraries expose the code base to an external risk. Um, this kind of errors, like forgetting to close a socket, should not lead to remote code execution, but nonetheless, this glue logic is where the bug originates. Um, the, the second takeaway is that <laughs> Every device you have facing the internet is a liability. The, the connection itself is an attack vector. So there are two main things you can do. You can patch and you can monitor communication, but the risk is there. And the last thing is that um, when you apply a cyber physical system in your network, you should take the physical aspect into account when assessing the risk. While ransomware and um, data exfiltration are serious issues, some devices hold the literal power to cause damage that are in ways that are all too easy, uh, all too easy to disregard. Or in other words, um, that's it. Uh, if you have some questions. We have time for questions. We have time for questions. I don't know. No. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your talk, pretty cool. Uh, just one question regarding the JTAG attack vector. Maybe I haven't heard it, but as far as I know, JTAG, you have to know, you know, just the, the, the protocol, but like how to talk to, to the device. How, how, how did you find out that? Did you like cut your hands on the specification? You mean the, you mean the, the JTAG connection, the yeah. RP phase? So yeah, when we opened the board, you could clearly see what, uh, what, what is the version of the SOC. Yeah. The, the data sheet is, can, can be found online. Okay. okay. Yeah. And yeah, the, this is the screenshot of the, of the RDP description. Okay. And I see. Can I add, and you can, you can uh, use a, a, a voltmeter to, uh, to find what pins are short, short circuit mm-hmm. to each yeah. other. So you can identify the pins. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would have three questions, if you don't mind. Um, so, first of all, um, the TI microprocessor connected over the UART interface, um, how could you attack this one? Was it part of the update process, or was the UART interface exposing the API that you can like connect or talk to the TI processor? 
So if I got it correctly, um, the question, the, the UPS, once you connect it, it performs the, the, it begins to perform the DNS queries. So it automatically connects and what the cloud can do, everything the cloud can do, an attacker can do if he bypasses the authentication. Uh, the question was, um, the ETI processor, the ETI processor controlling the H bridge. Was this <laughs> part of the update process, um, that you, yeah. did? okay. So, so the, the, one of the most fun, uh, fun, the, the fun parts, yeah, really fun of the, this vulnerability is that it allows to install a, a total firmware package. Mm -hmm. And this package includes the, 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 the firmware of, of every component mm -hmm. of okay. the UPS. Thanks. So basically we're able to hop straight okay. to the testing instruments. Okay, thanks. Uh, second question would be, did you check for the battery? Could you like mess around with the battery cells? Um, because as far as I know, they have much more um, potential to explode. Okay, so, so, um, we really didn't want to harm ourselves, and it's pretty much dangerous. Having said that, um, we were trying to, uh, to mess with, uh, in, uh products of lithium ion, uh, batteries that are more, mm, yes. uh, tend to, uh, explode. Mm. And we found that the, the entire um, communication protocol and everything like this, but we, uh, Decided that maybe uh, okay. for the sake of humanity, it's better to stop there. Um, <laughs> okay. Hope it answers. But I, I like the way you think. <laughs> and um, the, the third question would be: How long was the responsible disclosure process uh, with Schneider, since it's a physical device? Yeah. So um, I think we began the. Yeah, it was four or five months ago where we mm. uh, disclosed the vulnerabilities. The patch has been out, I think, for about a month. Um, so if, if you use this system, you should probably have gotten a, an update. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, check it. <laughs> oh, don't use it. <coughs> uh, just a simple question. How much money went up in smoke during this research? Or if you can't answer that, how many of these UPS were sacrificed for a greater cause? <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's a hard ans uh, question to answer because I, I don't have it. But uh, I think we perhaps tried about five or six of them during the so, uh, uh, during the the process of the firmware extraction. We accidentally destroyed a few in a different manner, but we were able to fix them while once we once we got the decryption process and the, the burning part. I think perhaps uh, two or three. If you see a resale of a UPS device from Armis, don't buy it. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, God that we survived this. Um, what is, uh, or um, did this also, um, how did you protect during your um, research from this, like, smoke? Do you recommend to do this uh, outside, or did you do this inside? Um, we used COVID masks. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a really smart answer to do. I, I, I really I inhaled a lot of evaporate of, of electrolyte material. So actually, right now I have a capacitance of like at least 100 for microfarad. <laughs> but uh, we we try to do that as responsibly as we could. Let's say that the first time we had some frightened colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, I have 10 questions. No, sorry. <laughs> um, just one about the lithium um, batteries. So as far as I know, um, all the lithium batteries have a uh, requirement to have some kind of hardware cutoff for circuits that protect from like overloading. Um, did you find any of, let's say, hardware-based protections in any of the UPS that you looked at? Or are there any on the market that might have some hardware protections okay. so this is actually not a lithium ion battery yeah uh, this is yeah. Uh, another technology another chemistry that is more uh, um, yeah it, it's not as uh, it, it doesn't it not it doesn't have the tendency to blow up uh, easily like lithium ion uh, but uh, for the lithium ion uh, devices I can say that they have like a battery management system uh, a quite smart one that Basically, the, does not a, uh, does not enable to uh, to mess with the configuration, and it implements all the <coughs> all the mitigations inside there in a 
in an, another integrated chip. Yes, um, but um, uh, could you imagine, or I mean, you could imagine that you could build an UPS that also has a hardware based circuit that protects against outputting, basically what you do, do, do you know if there's any on the market that, that has this kind of yeah. safety? So you're basically right, but on the other end, the UPS have its, uh, its purpose of correcting the, the output power, the output signal, because uh, it, it tries to, uh, to perfect it to be as much uh, closer to the, to the main electricity. And because of that, they have like a more flexible implementation that allows him to almost draw uh, the, uh, the output signal, and we have used this to, to do uh, almost all the attacks. So you have a trade-off here of the flexibility for the uh, software developers and, and protection, like everything in engineering. It, it always happens like this. But it's a good question, and you have more details about it in the, in the, in the white paper, and you can take a look. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to hang outside for a bit, so if anyone has questions, they can ask us there, and thank you all for listening.